Greetings all and salutations from a hotel room in Fort Leavenworth. I've been unable to stock up on material to release before coming here, so here's another simple one for now. For this video, I'm going to deal with the question of what killed T-34s in Korea? Or perhaps more accurately, what US tanks killed what T-34s in Korea? It was noted that gunfire as a whole, including anti-tank guns and artillery, killed less than 50% of Allied tanks in Europe. Did that hold true in Korea? It was estimated that when the war kicked off, Best Korea had some 225 T-34s in inventory, replacements of another 180 or so, with a total use then of just over 400, and any notable formations of T-34s no longer existed after 1950. Now, the tanks would still pop up here or there, but normally just in penny packets of maybe platoon strength or sections. So, obviously something was killing them in 1950. The statisticians and analysts wanted to know what. Well, the answer is the US Air Force. In 1952, their internal documentation claimed 921 enemy tanks destroyed and a further 925 damaged. Apparently somebody questioned these figures and so the Air Force analysts took another look at the data. They concluded that they had indeed counted wrong and later in 1952 announced they had actually destroyed 1,256 tanks and damaged a further 1,298. Not to be left out, the US Navy and Marine aviators claimed a further 163 tanks destroyed and 257 damaged. Now, I guess maybe they had higher standards for claiming a destroyed tank versus damage than the Air Force did. Interestingly, some 185 of these were claimed in 1951. And maybe that's why the UN ground forces didn't see any notable tank usage by North Korea. They had all been destroyed by carrier aircraft way behind the lines and beyond where any annoying little problems like confirmation from the guys on the ground needed to be worried about. Of course, the Black Shoe Navy couldn't let the flyboys have all the fun. And with 5, 8 and 16 inch guns to play with, they had a crack at shooting tanks at well. However, they ended up only claiming 12 destroyed and 12 damaged. So that gives us 1,431 tanks destroyed out of the North Korean total fleet of 400. Which meant that there was absolutely nothing for US tankers and bazookamen to shoot at. They merely walked past the disabled hulks of Soviet-built hardware. I think I have discussed the merits of aviation claims against armor in the past. But given that the US sent, by the period the tank-on-tank -tank combat had ended, the end of 1950, 679 M4A3s, 309 M26, 200 M46, and another 138 M24 to a total of 1,326 tanks, plus the assault guns, so the M4105s and the M45s, not too many, maybe about 10 or 15. It is likely, given these figures, that the tanks probably did encounter and kill each other. Being as they were on the ground, the Army's analysts were able to take a look at the actual vehicles that the North Koreans had left behind. 256 of them were found. Then, they went around interviewing tankers and looking at unit records to figure out what happened on the US side of these engagements. Given that the US tank crews generally made it to the end of the war, finding survivors to describe the engagements wasn't too hard. Further, given that very few US tankers ever engaged an enemy tank more than once, there was little chance of memory pollution or combining engagements into an incorrect story. What they remembered tended to be the way it was. The one tank battle of your life sort of burns itself into your memory. US tanks are known to have engaged North Korean tanks 119 times. 104 of these were Army tanks and 15 were Marine Corps. Most of these engagements were very small unit actions. Only eight, 15% of the total, were known to have evolved more than three tanks on each side. In gross numbers, 222 US tanks engaged 192 North Korean tanks. 
So usually, but not always, did it mean that the US had numerical superiority. In 11 engagements, the North Korean tanks outnumbered the US ones. On one occasion, a North Korean tank received the attentions of 10 US tanks at once. Actually, it doesn't say who won, but I'm, <laughs> I have my guesses. The single biggest tank battle saw 10 US tanks engaging eight T-34s. The British only ever had one tank battle and kind of didn't count. Three Centurions put a number of 20 pounder rounds into a Cromwell, which had been captured and placed into North Korean service. Hardly really fair. Other than that, the British tanks provided sterling service against infantry opposition, though it was observed that they actually really weren't as good at the job as they thought they might have wanted. They were envious of the fact that the US tanks could keep the bow machine gun while still carrying as much ammunition as Centurion. And they also saw a need for a good, flexible TC's cupola gun. Though they did want a protected one. They noticed how many US TC's became casualties flying, firing their Flex MG. And a shout out to Ed over on Armored Archives for tracking down the British report. So back to the Americans. Half the battles were M4 versus T-34, a third were Pershings, 10% were Pattons, and there was a small participation by M24s at 3%. 38 US tanks were counted as casualties of enemy fire from all causes. Four Chaffees, 20 Shermans, six Pershings, and eight Pattons. Of those, 16 were write-offs, the rest were returned to service after repair. 33% of the casualties were the result of hits. Four were abandoned due to non-gunfire related reasons, such as getting stuck in a ditch when you were evading, and one they just couldn't be sure about. Of those 38 knocked out tanks, 24 were knocked out by T-34s. 10 of those were knocked out without a penetrating hit. So you're looking at mobility or firepower kill most likely. Of the tanks penetrated by T-34, Two were M24, eight M4, three M26, and one M46. If you were in a Chaffee, Sherman, or Pershing penetrated by an 85mm, you had about a 40-45% chance of being wounded. If you were in an M24, the wound was all but guaranteed to be fatal. If in an M4, it was about 50-50, making the chance of death overall about 1 in 5, pretty similar to World War II. Pershing saw about a third of wounded crewmen being fatalities, and the one pattern which was penetrated saw just a wounded crewman. Things did not go so well for the North Koreans. 75% of North Korean tankers died, another 16% were wounded. If you were in a North Korean T-34, which was knocked out by anything from bazooka to 90mm, you had a 1 chance in 10 of getting out unscathed. If you were engaged by a 90mm, you either were wounded in the tank or trying to get away from the tank. Nobody escaped any of the 15 T-34s known hit by a Pershing without getting hurt. In terms of the general environment, the ranges were a little bit more extreme than World War II on both ends of the scale, at least compared to the ranges observed in Western Europe the previous decade. Due to the rough terrain in Korea, no, lots of mountains, you either had a very limited line of sight or somebody was on elevated terrain and they had great line of sight. As a result, the average engagement range in Korea was actually a touch longer than that in Western Europe, at some 730 yards. A few engagements were in excess of two kilometers and were a few in about three and a half kilometers away and this sort of skewed the average. The median engagement range, however, was shorter than that in Europe. Over half of all tank-on-tank -tank engagements in Korea occurred at under 350 yards. Indeed, one in three were under 150 yards, and one in six were under 50 yards. Something which was observed was that the North Koreans were very, very good at concealment. And they also liked going for keyhole shots, or keyhole shot is when you use some terrain to obstruct the opposition's view of you until it's too late. Also, one in five engagements was at night. And actually, at night was when US forces performed less well compared to their enemies. Actually, I should caveat that. They, the ratio of getting worse 
kind of was in favor of the North Koreans, not that they necessarily did better all the time. The locations of hits on target by vehicles or towed guns, at least on US tanks, was similar to that found in World War II. Just under 40% of the hits were to the front, over half to the side and about 5% to the rear. One in three were hits to the turret. When a US tank fired first, overall, the result was six times more favorable than if the US tank fired second. This was even though the North Koreans demonstrated absolutely atrocious gunnery skills, even when firing first. They had about a one in three chance of a first round hit overall. Americans had closer to a two third chance overall. At short ranges, the differences were more marked. At 350 yards or less, the majority range, remember, the US tank scored a hit almost every time, first time. Whilst the T-3485, if it got a shot off, had a 50-50 chance of a hit. Overall, the T-34s are estimated to have fired 176 rounds at US tanks to obtain 66 hits and the aforementioned 38 knocked out US tanks. Sorry, 24 of them by T-34s. The actual accuracy rates of T-34s were probably lower. After all, if the North Koreans fired, they didn't hit the target, and nobody noticed that they were getting shot at, the round would go unaccounted for, unless somebody went up to a knocked out T-34 and started counting spent shell cases. Shermans were known to have fired some 130 rounds at T-34s. Now, no, the, the North Koreans also had SU-76s, so it's not as if these were the only armored vehicles getting shot at, but the study is purely focused on tanks. Of these rounds, 53 were APC, 29 high explosive, 43 HVAP, and 5 white phosphorus. And this is considered part of the reason for the high fatality rates of North Korean tankers, and it also matches with evidence of US practice in World War II. A US tank wasn't satisfied when it seemed to hit the enemy. It fired repeatedly and it fired a variety of ammunition types for the greatest possible variety of effects. Overall, US tanks fired a total of 52% APC, 19% HE, 27% HVAP, and 2% white phosphorus at T-34s. An interesting chart is the first round hit probability on moving targets versus stationary. As you can see, a US tanker in Korea was more likely to hit a stationary target than a moving one at under about 150, uh, correction, 750 yards. At over 750 yards, you were more likely to get a first round hit if your target was moving. Now, of course, there is a reason for this, even if at first the whole thing seems a bit counterintuitive. And I've said it before, the single biggest factor in generating a miss is range estimation error. Figuring out just how far away a moderately distant target is when it's stationary and thus probably either under some form of camouflage or otherwise not fully visible to figure out what you're looking at can be tricky. Yet if the target is moving, it's probably much easier to see clearly and to estimate range to target. Overall, US tankers tended to win two times out of three. They'd lose one time out of five and the rest was generally inconclusive. The time of greatest success for the DPRK tank corps came in July and August of 1950, even against M4s. US tankers were green, arriving at a front under great pressure, and they may not have had the force ratios perhaps that they would be used to. However, after a period in August when no enemy tanks were battled, the ratio dropped dramatically into the US favor. Firstly, US armor crews had found their feet. Secondly, M26 had arrived. Not only was it a better tank killer in the event that I could actually get to where the enemy tanks happened to be, but there was a suspicion that as a Pershing looked kind of vaguely more like an M24 instead of a, like a Sherman due to the overall low shape and independent suspension, North Korean tankers misidentified the M26 as the far less dangerous and more vulnerable M24. If true, the report says, this mistake proved fatal. Effectiveness ratios dropped from then on, partially because US tankers were getting better with better equipment and partially because the Korean tankers were getting killed and their replacements were showing up you know, lesser trained to use the replacement tanks that were being delivered. Overall, US tanks were considered responsible almost certainly for 97 T-34s and probably responsible for an additional 18. 
Out of the overall 400 plus believed to have been on issue to the North Koreans, you're lucky in about a quarter of them. In terms of the general opinion of things, none of the three US mediums were perfect. The M4 had the best overall reliability, but summer, uh, suffered some of the highest non-combat loss rates, mainly accidents. The steering system with a minimum radius affected mobility in particularly restrictive terrain. And of course, the M4 would be the most likely type of tank, being smaller and lighter than the other two, to go into that nasty terrain in the first place. Imagine hillside roads or mountainside roads. Also, driving the thing was considered physically more exhausting, which may have led to some accidents. Now, of course, more exhausting is a relative term by American standards, considering you know, how exhausting some of Sherman's contemporaries were. The M26 with the automatic transmission was much easier to operate, but the engine just wasn't cutting it. Not enough oomph to get the BC around in the terrain, including mountains, reliably. Finally, the M46 had a great engine, and it was really easy to drive with both the automatic transmission and the wobble stick steering controller, and it had neutral steer, but the transmission system hadn't been quite sorted out yet to proper reliability. So anyway, those are some interesting facts and figures for you. As ever, I hope you found it interesting and informative. Take care. I'll talk to you on the next one.